ready. Over the past few weeks since my returning from Sierra Nevada mountains, we have been, uh, well, a number of people have said that they've heard the best three sermons they've ever heard in 25 years of preaching. They've never heard sermons as great or as good or as uh, effective as the sermons that, we, that have been preached. And this past Sabbath, we preached uh, the sermon, The New Wine and the New Name, a sermon that lasted for two hours and 17 minutes. I have never in all my days ever preached that long on any particular sermon. Elder Joseph Smith said that it was, after listening to me for 25 years, that is the greatest sermon he has ever heard. Now, here's what I want to say to you, what the Lord said on, to us on Saturday, that he is with us. There's a verse in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 28, <clears throat> and... Um, my Bible is, oh, I need, need a new Bible here. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 28, <clears throat> uh, verse 20. There's a verse here where Jesus said, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you. And lo, lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. Now, that segment of that message Jesus is giving his, fi his farewell statement to his, uh, his apostles. And he, after they've watched three years of his ministry and much more of his life, he is saying to them, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world, that there's never going to be a time, but he, even though he's taking his ascension on, on, on Mount Olivet, he's going back to the Father in heaven. He said to them that he is with them. Now, here's what I've been saying to the members of the Outlaw family, that Jesus is with us. When you walk along the street, you're not alone. When you walk through a storm, hold your head up high and you'll never walk along. OK. All right. At any rate. When you are driving your car, when you're going into Walmart or when you're going into uh, a grocery store, or when you're at home at night, or when you're working on your job with thousands of people around you, Jesus said to us on Saturday that we are never alone, that he is with us. And his being with us means that we can do all things through him who gives us the strength. And here is what I want to say to you. Here's what I want to say to you, that Almighty God... His name is Jesus, has constrained our, call, our gifts, not our calling. Now, our calling has been outlawed for 28 years, but he has constrained our gifts all the years of our life that we might be able to now bring forth those gifts to accomplish the things wherein our calling is. Now, listen to this very carefully. There was a man born blind. And had been blind for many years. And in John's gospel chapter 9, the disciples and Jesus walked by him one day. And Jesus said, I've made him, birthed him out of his mother's womb blind so I could come by 40 years after his birth, open his eyes, and you could see the miracle power. Now, I want everybody to understand that, take a person like Ruth Brown, for instance, who is now the administrator of the Mary, Mary Magdalene Mira ministry, that God has constrained her gifts until this very hour that God has constrained her gifts, though she's very gifted, very talented, God has constrained her gifts all the years of her life until this very talented time now where she is to be able to walk forward as the administrator and walk forward as an evangelist. And we'll come back to Ruth Brown in just a moment and all the other seven evangelists. But what I want to say to you, that you could have done greater things years ago, but it wasn't time. And not what it, it wasn't time, but God constrained. In other words, like the blind man born blind, the Lord did not let you. And while you're, while, you're, while you're thinking on that and receiving that from the Lord, understand also that the Lord is with you and he always has been with you 
He used to be with you in terms of just constraining your gifts because you could have exploded on the world stage doing extraordinary things, but he constrained you because he wasn't ready to use you at that time. He was with you that way. Now he is with you in the explosion of your gifts and your talents. Now, listen to this very carefully, Atla people. We've had a calling now for some time, 28 years, the calling, the vision of Atla has been our calling. But Paul writes, no, now know this, that all things work together for good for those that love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. Please remember that and know that you're never alone. But I want to give you another example. Then I want to read something from Precious LaFleur. I want to read some, then I want to show you something about what God has done with the members of the outlaw church. And I spoke it on this past Saturday. I want to show you something. That um, <clears throat> about God constraining your gifts. There was a man born uh, named Moses. Where, where am I at? <clears throat> I'm, in, I'm in Genesis. I'm supposed to be in Exodus. Pardon me. The calling of Moses' birth was to be a deliverer of God's people. Moses was born 80 years before the deliverance of God's people out of bondage in Egypt. Now, some of y'all are 50, 60 years old, 40, 50, 60, 70 years old right now. And God is just beginning to release your gifts. You were born 50 years ago, 40 years ago, 60 years ago, 70 years ago. But now in this time of the tribulation, which is the other key verse here, will God cause your gifts and your talents to now come alive? Actually, because you've had these gifts all these years, He's had to constrain them, that he was with you by constraining them. But now he's with you by releasing them. Now, I'm going to speak more about that. Remind me to speak more about that in just a moment. But I want to give you the best example I can find. I'm going to give you the example of Moses. Then I want to give you the example of Hannah, the example of, 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 uh, of Sarah and Abraham, and the example of Elizabeth and Zacharias and, and the man born blind and you and others. But now there was a man born named Moses 80 years before the, the, the declaration of independence and the granting of the land of Israel to the people of Egypt. Moses was born 80 years earlier than that time. It was going to happen. And Moses was born to set that in order. He was born to set that in order 80 years before it took place. But God had to constrain Moses. Let me show you what I mean. Where am I at now? Um, well, look in, in Exodus chapter 2, verse 11. And it came to pass in those days when Moses was grown, that he went out unto his brethren and spied an Egyptian smiting a Hebrew, one of the brethren. And he looked this way and that way. And he, when he saw that there was uh, no man, he slew the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. And when he had went out a second day, behold, two men of the Hebrews strove together. And he said unto them, he that did the wrong, Wherefore smitest thou fellow? Now, what does this mean? This to be very carefully. Moses was 40 years old. Moses had been born, ordained to be the deliverer of God's people out of bondage, out of Egypt, out of slavery, into the promised land, into the land flowing with milk and honey. If some of you were born 30, 40, 50 years ago, 60 years, 70 years ago, to serve in the time of the tribulation and serve as one of God's elect, to serve as one that will see the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. You were born 70 years ago, 60 years ago, 50 years ago, 40 years ago, 30 years ago. Let's come back to Moses. At the age of 40 years old, Moses went out and killed an Egyptian. He was 40 years old. 
And when it was discovered what he had done, Moses fled Egypt because he had killed the Egyptian trying to deliver his brethren from the hard taskmasters and the slavery. He killed one Egyptian. Now listen to me very carefully because your gifts are bubbling up inside of you and the Holy Ghost ought to be moving inside of you. You ought to feel the Holy Ghost moving inside of you now while I'm talking. You ought to feel the Holy Ghost and the gifts inside of you coming together like dry bones while I speak to you. So at the age of 40, at the age of 40, Moses tried to do what he was born to do. In, in Exodus chapter 2, starting at verse 11, at the age of 40, Moses tried to do, he tried to deliver his brethren from oppression and from slavery. He tried to do it at 40 years old because that's why God birthed him. Uh, his, that's why he came into the world. He was born to deliver his brethren. He was born to live. That was what he was born to do. And he tried it at 40 years of age. It didn't work out. He had to leave town. He had to leave town. At 40 years of age, he had to leave Egypt. If you go one chapter over to chapter 3 of the book of Exodus, we don't have to go there now because most of y'all know it. 40 years after, 40 years after, now we're talking about how God, had, you're 70 years old now, you're 60 years old, you're 80 years old, you're 50 years old, you're 40 years old, you're 30 years old, how God has constrained your gifts. Sarah was 90 years old. Sarah was 90. And I believe Elizabeth, Zachariah's wife, was 90 years old, too. Moses was born to be a deliverer, but it took 80 years. Even though he, had, he was born with the gift, he was born with the anointing, he was born with the power, he was born with the calling, and he tried it midway to 80 years at 40 years old by killing the Egyptian, trying to deliver his brethren from oppression and slavery, and he had to leave town. One chapter over in the book of Exodus, he meets Almighty God. He meets Yahweh. He meets Jehovah Nissi. He meets Jehovah Jireh. He meets Jehovah Shalom. He meets him there on the backside of Mount Horeb in a burning bush. He's 80 years old now. He's 80 years old. And it was at the age of 80 that God finally said, all right, Moses, I'm going to let you I'm going to let your gifts go. And I'm going to let you do now what you've been called to do from the day of your birth. Before I formed you in your mother's womb, you were called a deliverer. You were born a deliverer. Before I formed you in your mother. And at 80 years old, Moses had lost faith then. Like some of y'all may have lost faith. At 80 years old, God told Moses there in the burning bush in, in Exodus chapter 3. God, God, at 80 years old, Mo, God told Moses, go down there now and do what you tried to do when you were 40 years old. And Moses said, I can't do it. And God said, you're going to do it. And he did. He had given up like some of y'all may have given up. I don't think most I think most of y'all are hearing me now. Well, maybe you had given up. Maybe y'all had crawled back into a corner and said it ain't going to never happen for me. My life is over with that part of my life. My ministry, my power, my serving God is all over with. I'm just going to be a nice person and and try to walk upright. But I ain't going to step out and be a, a no major servant of the Lord, especially like that James David Manning fella. And you just crawl back and had said, relax. But God says to Moses, no, you're going down there to Egypt. No, you're going down there. You're going down there to Egypt. You're going down there. You're going down and you're going to set them free. And didn't he go down there? Suppose Moses, now listen to this very carefully, as you look at the fact that you're 80 or 70 or 60 or 50 or 40 or 30. Look, suppose Moses had caused those 10 plagues that he, I mean, he, he, Moses called 10 plagues to fall on Egypt at 80 years old. Suppose he had caused those 10 plagues at, at 40. Well, he couldn't. Well, I don't know if he couldn't, but Jesus wouldn't let him. Moses killed an Egyptian at 40, but at 80, he killed the firstborn of every Egyptian in, in Egypt. You see the difference in the gifts. You see the difference, and you see how God constrained him. Now, I want you to hear that. I want you to hear that. 
And God was with Moses. God was with Moses when he killed that Egyptian. God was with Moses when he was out there for 40 years walking around behind them sheep out there and them goats and rams for 40 years out there with Jephro's sheep. God was still with him. And then God let his gifts. God says, all right, it's now time for your gifts. It's now time for you to do your thing. The same thing he's telling me to tell you. I'm talking to you right now. The same thing God says you've been holding. He's been holding your gifts in constraint for some time. And now it's time for you to stand up. Praise almighty God. Now, I want to read a letter here, a note that I got the other day from one of our members. Uh, her name is uh, Precious Lufflor. Uh, here it is. And she says, Peace, Honorable Manning. I have been bothering you a lot lately, so this will be short. On the 28th of September, 2019, I caught the Holy Ghost for the first time. I've never felt so liberated. This past Sabbath on the 4th of October, 2019 was the best lesson you have ever taught. Oh, there's another one chiming in with Elder Smith. So now this is precious. She's the wife of um, of, of uh, Captain LaFleur and the mother of uh, four children in the church. And uh, she's Sabbath and, uh, and, and Rainbow uh, sister. Here's what she continues to write. She said, the spirit that resided in worship was, uh, was different. She's talking about this past Sabbath. I felt as though I was in Catholic school learning lesson. Both experiences has inspired me to write a new poem called I Am Free. Thank you, Pastor Manning, for being the Lord's servant. Now, this is from, this is from Precious. This is uh, Captain LaFleur's wife. Uh, this is Zipporah, uh, uh, Glory, and, and uh, Isaiah and Elisha's mother. She's the sister, the younger sister of Matron Farr, our program director, and Sabbath, our host here at the Manning Report. And she's been a member of this church now for a goodly number of years. All right, this is her and her, her family. But she says that, that the 28th of October, September rather, that uh, that she caught the Holy Ghost. She received the Holy Ghost for the first time. And then she said this past Sabbath was the, uh, the, the, the great message or the greatest, uh, was, was a, a lesson. Uh, you heard me read. It was different. She felt this using Catholic school training experiences. So I, I want to put that up because we've had Deborah said to me, when well, I put Deborah's picture up, but Deborah said to me that the message I taught and the message title was, I forgot to tell you I know how to fly. That was a message taught three weeks ago. I forgot to tell you I know how to fly. Deborah said that was the best one she's ever heard. She's been listening to me for 20 years. Now, Sabbath said the message I taught, 37, 37, 37, new wine, was the best she ever heard. She's been listening for over 20 years as well. But now we got Precious chiming in and we got Elder Joseph Smith. So let's get back to it now. If that's the case, and we're going to talk more about this or teach more about that, if that's the case, if these are the best messages, then we have to realize that what God is saying, that the gifts are now being, my gifts are now being released at a level they've never been released before. But you have to always remember when you see me, you have to always remember that I'm a man after God's own heart. And whatever God does through me is not for me. Now, I was looking at, uh, uh, I think it's 1 Samuel chapter 13, verse 14, where God says that David is a man after his own heart. Now, I'll come back to that verse. We'll read it together in just a moment. But you have to remember, Atla, that what God does through me is not for me, but for you. You have to understand that. And one of the things that you all, what I want men to understand, and righteous men and men on the path of being righteous, or men that are fallen, I want you to understand something. That all of my sufferings and victories, and I have many of them, and you know I do. You know I have many sufferings and many victories, you men of Atla. You know I have many sufferings. You need to see this 
as an example for you. These sufferings that I go through is not for me, and the victories that I have that are not for me, they're all for you. Both my sufferings and my victories to show you what God can do if you would just stand on the word of God and stand as a man of God. Well, you're going to be persecuted, you're going to suffer, but you're also going to have victory. You can't have no victories, you can't have no cross without, uh, you know, crown without a cross. And you can't have no victory without a battle. See, many of the men want to be strong, righteous men, but they don't want to have no battle. You got to have battles in order to get a victory. And, and going back to everybody else now, you need to understand that, as, as it says in 1 Samuel chapter 13, verse 14, that uh, God said that David, and I'm David, my name is David, God said that David, I'm not the David of a king of Israel, but God said that David was a man after his own heart. Now, when I met the Lord in uh, the Brooklyn House of Detention back in July of 1976, I asked him if he would look upon me as he did his servant David. I didn't even know what a servant was, but I said that. I said if he would look upon me as he did his servant David, and he said yes. And, uh, and then God said of David, Mr. Engine, put that verse up there. He said, he said of David, he said, David is a man after my own heart. All right, where's that at? Is that them? That, but now the kingdom is that. Yeah, but, no, but now the kingdom shall not continue. But the Lord hath sought him a man after his own heart. And the Lord hath commanded him to be captain over his people because uh, thou has not kept, he was talking to Saul. He's telling Saul, your kingdom shall not continue, but it will continue under a man after my own heart. Talking about David. So you need to understand that God is with us. He said to the disciples in Matthew's gospel chapter 19, I mean, uh, uh, chapter, chapter 28, rather, verse 20, he said, Lo, I am with you. Remember, I read that one earlier. Lo, I am with you always. I'm with you. Now, you need to know that you're walking along the street or you're going in the grocery store, or you're driving your car, or you're riding on the airplane, or you're, you're riding on the bus, or you're working at the computer, or you're doing whatever you're doing. You have to understand something. Jesus promised those disciples, he told them, I am with you always. Put that back up, Miss Angie. He told them, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. I will never leave you. And I'll add, and never forsake you either. So I want you to know now that the Lord is with you. Now, but I want to back up for just a minute. Know right now that God is with us, Allah. He, God is with us. And all things work together for good for those that love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. And we have a calling. We have a calling. We have a calling. We have a multitudinous calling. You go to a lot of places, people, they call them worship centers. I don't think they are. I think God's abandoned them. But let's say, let's say you believe some of these Baptists, Methodists, Pentecostals, whatever the places of churches, you go in there, everybody in there got a different calling. You go in there, everybody in there got a different calling. Can I share something with you? Can I share something with you? You go to some of these churches, you go there, you sit down there with Joel Osteen and one of these people. Everybody in there that say they got a calling is different from somebody else's calling sitting right next to them. Right? But if you come to Atla, we have one calling. That is the that is the Atla, the land where the people shall walk bare for Atla. That's what God said. That's all of our callings. Now we have different gifts to reach that calling. You see what I'm saying? You see how clear that is? Now, so I want you to understand that uh, God is with you the same way he was with Sarah, who was 90 years old and she couldn't get pregnant. She watched Hagar get pregnant, but she couldn't get pregnant. You know, and but God was with her. God didn't want her to get pregnant. He stopped her. From, she could have gotten pregnant when she was 13. Well, I don't know that they're young, but no, God stopped it. God stopped it. She waited another 70, 87 years, another 77 years before she got pregnant. She could have got pregnant the moment she had her menstrual. The next day after her menstrual cycle ended, she could have gotten pregnant had she been married to Abraham. I don't know when they got married. 
But if she got a menstrual cycle at 13, well, the day after that uh, menstrual cycle had finished, she could have gotten pregnant. She was ready. But God wouldn't let her. G God kept the pregnancy out of her uh, for 77 years. 77 years longer than some of y'all been living because God wasn't ready for it. God was not ready for Isaac to be born. God wasn't ready yet. He wasn't ready for her gifts. God wasn't ready. The time had not come. Like your time hadn't come 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, 35, 40, 45, 50 years. Your time had not come, but it's, now is the time. Now is the season. Now everybody's saying, Pastor Man, we ain't never heard you preach like this before. So what do you mean? I've been preaching for 40 years. So we ain't never heard you preach like this. I said, I've been preaching for 40 years. Precious wrote that she just received the Holy Ghost. She's been in the church, I don't know, 20 some years. She said she just received the Holy Ghost. Now's the time. Now's the time. And the thing we need to know is that God is with us. The thing that we need to know is that the Lord is, is with us, that, that God is with us, that Lord is with us whithersoever we go is. Now, so it's very important that you understand that Moses, suppose Moses had worked at 40 years old what God didn't want him to do till he was 80 years old. Well, how old are you now? Moses could have done down there in Egypt when he was 40, well, I know he couldn't. Let me take that back. No, he could not have done it. Go God. He had the power. He had the anointing. He had the calling to do it. But God wouldn't let it happen. Sometimes people, you know, people think the devil's stopping them from doing things. The devil ain't stopping. That's the Lord stopping you. He ain't ready for you yet. The Lord ain't ready for you yet. It ain't the devil stopping you. Not somebody as powerful as you. The devil can't stop you. The Lord... And so Moses went out there and he's tried his power out. He tried his power and he killed the Egyptian. He tried his power out. Okay, so he killed one Egyptian. la di da But it wasn't time. But now, you know, I spoke on this past Saturday. And then I've been speaking since we came back. Elizabeth and I came back from Sierra Nevada Mountain. We've been talking and teaching now about the new wine and the new time and the new name. And everybody's saying, well, Pastor, we ain't never heard you preach like that. Well, I'm glad I'm not thin-skinned because I'd be a little bit insulted. I thought I was going to town years ago. I thought I was preaching years ago. I thought I was going to town preaching. They said, no, Pastor. Deborah said, no. I do have to tell you that message I preached about. I forgot to tell you. I know how to fly. I thought that was at least an interesting message. Then the other message that I taught, and by the way, I'm going to ask the program director to put all three of those messages in a package so far as the greatest messages ever, the three greatest messages ever, 37, 37, New Wine, where I talked about the deception and a, a, a number of other things, but people picked up on the deception. And then the other message, I forgot to tell you, I know how to fly. And then we had a great lunch out in the courtyard thereafter. And then this past Sabbath, the message I taught was um, the, uh, new, the new wine and the new name. And now we got uh, Elder Smith chimed in. Now we got Precious chiming in as well. And God is saying he's with you. You're walking along the sidewalk, right? You're walking the street. You're on the train. You're on the bus. You're on the boat. You're on the plane. God is with you. You're God's child. You, 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 you're God's child. You walk into the, you know, to the store, you know, to the drugstore, Walmart or, you know, Walgreens or something. Everybody else in there, I don't know who those people are. I don't know who they are. I don't know who these people are, but you're God's child. When you, <coughs> when you walk in there, you're God's child. You, you, walk in the, you walk in the Golden Corral. You're God's child. Don't you ever forget it. Yes, sir. He, and he's with you. He said, Lo, I'm with you even to the end of the age. He said, even to the, I'll, I'll go with you to the end of the age. I ain't going to take no vacation. God said, Lo, I'm with you even to the end of the way. You're God's child. 
Good God Almighty. Good God Almighty. A good, 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 good
Well, at any rate, verse 10. You got to read these verses seven times. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I will keep thee from uh, the hour of temptation which shall fall upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. Behold, I come quickly. Hold that uh, fast which thou hast, that no man taketh thy crown. He that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of God, and uh, he shall go uh, no more out, but I will write upon him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God, and I will write upon him my new name, which is Atla. He that hath, that to read verse 6, 13, because that makes the seventh verse. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. And I read that seven times and expect a miracle. You read that and expect God to speak to you. Read, and I'm going to give you other verses to read, and when you read it seven times, uh, expect God to speak to you. When you read those verses seven times. Now, what I'm going to do, I'm going to ask the engineer to let you hear a little bit of that message I preached on Saturday, which was the message called the new name and the new time, the new wine and the new time. I'm going to let you listen to a little bit of it uh, because, because we now got uh, Precious LaFleur has chimed in on this message. Um, so and I'm going to we're going to have the prayer meeting tonight. We'll see what the Lord will do. And then, of course, we got um, uh, we got the ordination of Minister Joe Lewis Matos. Joe Lewis Matos is going to be ordained on this Saturday to the gospel. Y'all know him. He stands by me all the time over there in the pulpit. He's a, he's a young man with the ponytail. Joe Lewis Matos, I'm going to be ordaining him Saturday. I'm going to ordain him on Saturday. And then I'm going to be appointing the captains to El Capitan. And some of our young people will be giving testimony according to Elder LaFleur. He's got a segment in the worship world. He'll have some of the young people giving testimony about Niagara Falls. But I want you to know this. You're not alone. You were never alone. You were never alone. There's a great poem called Footprints. I don't see very much of it anymore. But you have never been alone. And the thing that you might want to, you know, when we come to get together again in the church, is that one of the reasons why you have not exploded on the world scene with your, your gifts and talents is because like Moses, God has kept you. You could have done something 40 years ago and maybe you tried 40 years ago. This is the absolute truth. I'll tell you before, God, this is the absolute truth. I, you know, one day I was driving down uh, 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 Fulton Street in Brooklyn past Nostrand Avenue up toward Buffalo and uh, uh, and uh, New York Avenue, and I saw my brothers out there. It was in the hot summer of July, and I saw my brothers out there nodding out on heroin. This is in the 60s, right? And I was driving to my new, brand new Mercury Mont Montego that I just got for Procter and Gamble. And you should have seen that. You should have seen that car Ford Motor Company gave me. I had a red uh, Comet. What? That was bad. Um, but at any rate, uh, so I said, well, my brothers, look at my brothers with a with a jacket over his show on his arm. He's nodding out on Fulton Street. Everybody looked like to me. Everybody was heroin. You could smell heroin cooking in Bedford Stuyvesant. I said, I'm going to do something. So I left my job. This is the honest to God truth. I just the honest to God truth. I left my job in and at Procter and Gamble, and I, I I started breaking into Jews' home. I'm sorry, brother Jews. I still love y'all, all the Jews, and happy Yom Kippur. Happy Yom. I started breaking into Jews' home. Why did I break into Jews' home? Because I knew they had jewelry. I knew they had you know breaking breaking into, break into black people's home. I don't know about a television. That's what you can get out of black people's house. I know Jew, and I and I tried to liberate my brothers by breaking into Jews' home. That was 40 years ago. You see what I'm saying? I tried to break and I tried to liberate my brothers by breaking into Jewish homes. I'm sorry, Jewish brothers. I'm sorry. I was meeting with a Jew yes, yesterday, a Jewish lawyer yesterday. I told him too that I used to live right here about you, and I live with two Jews, one named uh, Aaron and Aviva Klein. They were really nice, two nice Jews. I lived in their house till I started breaking into Jews' homes. Why did I do that? I tried 40 years ago to do what I'm doing now. You see, and the same thing for you. 
The same thing for you. And, but I don't care. You say, Pastor Man, I'm not married. I go home. It's cold. It's cold. It's dark. Ain't nobody in there. You're not alone. You say, well, Pastor Man, my family members, they don't honor me no more. They crazy. They, you know, I, I want you to know you're not alone. Join the Allah family. Then, brother, what's wrong with you? Now, we're also, we're going to be uh, appointing these El Capitans, and then we're going to take Mother Shekinah Seals. Every week, we're going to celebrate Mother Shekinah Seals' birthday. She's 100 years old on the 4th of July, the year 2020. And uh, we are celebrating her birthday, uh, 100 years old, and God's brought, us, brought her to our church. And we're going to take her on the Orient Express uh, as, a, as a major birthday gift, finally. We're supposed to be traveling. At least we're working on our travel. We're working on our travel to Egypt in April of, of, of 2020 as well. There are a lot of things that are going on and wanted to uh, apprise you of those things that are happening. And uh, but there's a lot of exciting things that are happening here at the Outlaw World Missionary Church. And we're giving God the praise and the glory and the honor. OK, so I think I've said enough here. Remember, now we need your financial support. Don't let the sodomites, don't let the sodomites rejoice and say we stop. We took down Manning. We closed down his church. We stopped people from coming. We wrote all kind of nasty lies about it. Don't let don't let the sodomites do that. By the way, I'm glad what happened in the Supreme Court. They said you can fire a sodomite. They're working on your job. The Supreme Court said that yesterday. Well, praise God. I'll get more of that a little bit later on. But don't let the, send me your financial support. By the way, Goldfinger, thank you very much, Goldfinger. Goldfinger, Goldfinger, Goldfinger. Goldfinger is sending gifts now every week. Lord have mercy, Goldfinger. Goldfinger, Goldfinger. I think one week I got two gifts from Goldfinger. This is a bit of a news blog we do, looking at spiritual wickedness in high places for the most part, making uh, some observations about it and giving people a biblical foundation to the way of interpreting rather than have uh, uh, Sean Hannity or Laura Ingram or Janine Pirro or Anderson Cooper or Rachel Maydow or Don Lemon. Uh, Rush Limbaugh interpret what's going on in the world. You come to me and I'll tell you based on what the Word of God says. They'll just give you their worldly, sinful view. But the man will tell you what God has said, whether to say yea or nay, whether to go or to stay. You'll be like led by the Word of Almighty God. Come to the man report on a daily basis to interpret the spiritual wickedness in high places because there's plenty of it that's going on. And so I am he, I'm the Lord, sir, James David Righteous Rebel Manning, and I'm here to serve you with news and information.